Okay, good morning, everybody. This is the Committee on Agriculture. My name is Mark Hashem. I'm the chair of the committee. Sitting to my right is the vice chair, Amy Peruso. And to my left is Representative Lisa Martin. Joining on other members on Zoom that I can't really see. Um, Today is Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. It's 10 a.m. and we're video conferencing via room 325. Okay, because this is a morning hearing, we must adjourn prior to noon floor session. And so if you go late, I'm so, I apologize in advance, not all testifiers may have the opportunity to testify in that event. Please uh, know that your written testimony is considered and is a part of the packet. Please keep yourself muted and your video off while waiting, in the, waiting to testify. And after the testimony is complete, the Zoom chat function will allow you to chat with the technical staff only. I don't, I or the members of the committee cannot see your Zoom chat. If you're disconnected, you may attempt to rejoin the meeting. If disconnected while presenting testimony, you may be allowed to continue if time permits. Please note that the house is not responsible for any bad internet connections on the testifier's end. In the event of a network failure, it may be necessary to reschedule the hearing or schedule a meeting for decision-making. In that case, an appropriate notice will be posted. Uh, please avoid using any trademark and copyright images. Please refrain from profanity or uncivil behavior. Such behavior may be grounds for removal from the hearing without, in, without the ability to rejoin. We don't have a specific um, time. We're not timing you. We don't have a specific time, but if you start to ramble and go on, we'll just mute you. So <laughs> please, um, please be please be aware of the please be aware of and conscious of everybody else's time. So first up, we're going on HB. 1726 relating to agriculture bu buildings. First testifier we have is Department of Agriculture, Phyllis Shimabukuro. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser, Chairperson, Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'll briefly summarize our um, testimony. Uh, the department supports the intent of many of the proposed amendments that appear to be intended to reduce or eliminate kinds of structures and uses that appear to be inconsistent with the purpose and the intent of the exemption for agricultural buildings and structures from the building code and the building permit. The department strongly objects to the roles and responsibilities assigned to the department to enforce compliance. The function of approving agricultural farm plans for each property proposing agricultural buildings is and must remain and reside within each county along with the proposed inspection of the property. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Ron, Rodney Fun, Funakoshi from De Department of Planning and Sus Sustainable Development. We changed the name, that's right. With comments? Uh, yeah, good morning, Chair Hasham, Vice Chair Peruso, and members of the House Committee on Agriculture. The Office of Planning and Sustainable Development stands on its testimony offering comments on the measure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have Earl Yamamoto of Department of Agriculture. Um, with comments. Hey, wait a minute, hold on. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, uh, I, I miss, uh, I miss hit on the uh the sign up the sign up for uh for this bill so what uh chair shimubukuro geyser is has said is uh is 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 my uh testimony we have the same testimony okay thank you thank you thank you very much next is mario sui lee department of planning and permitting with in support 
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Um, this is Mary Sue Lee, um, speaking for the Department of Planning and Permitting of the City and County of Honolulu. Uh, we strongly support the bill, um, and we obviously stand on the testimony that we have already submitted. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have Nicole Galase, um, Hawaii Cattlemen's Council, with comments. Okay, next up we have Brian Miyamoto, Hawaii Farm Bureau, in opposition. Good morning, Chair Hashem, Vice Chair Perusal, members of the Agriculture Committee. My name is Brian Miyamoto here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. The Hawaii Farm Bureau um, respectfully opposes this measure. Uh, we are aware of, of the many problems associated with it, illegal homes on agriculture land, especially in the city and county of Honolulu. Um, however, the current law that this is looking to address already provides for exemptions, that provides for exemptions for non-residential agricultural structures and clearly doesn't allow residential buildings for use on these lands that are seeking the exemptions. Um, this bill defeats the purpose of the statute that it seeks to amend we know that this is not the intent of the bill, but there will certainly be consequences. Um, I'll highlight just a few of our concerns. Um, one of the things that this bill seeks to do is prohibit the connection of electrical power plumbing systems and sewer pipes to an exempted building. Uh, farms use or need power. Uh, they need plumbing, they need sewers. Uh, with FISMON, with food safety requirements, um, water is needed to process ag products. Um, power is needed to do value added processing if a farm is, is vertically integrated. Um, the bill also restricts the definition of greenhouses to just buildings made of glass. Um, greenhouses are constructed of many other types of materials. Um, that are less expensive, and, and again, that, that, are, that are farmers and ranchers needed. In fact, we, we, we put together a, a request for some funding for high wind tunnels, which are low cost, and which we really think can support our small farmers. Um, and the bill doesn't grandfather farmers who already use the exemption. And so we're concerned that if this bill does pass, uh, many of these farmers may find themselves in violation. Uh, I won't go through all of our concerns, but we do have a lot of concerns and we do understand that the, the concerns with these illegal structures, we believe that there already is in chapter uh, 4688 um, uh, provisions in there, uh, requirements that those that are using exemptions need to submit written notice um, before and after uh, that they do need to get certain um, approvals. So uh, again, you know, we're just concerned that this defeats the efforts that were put forward by the farming community to exempt these non-residential low risk structures that can support our farmers and ranchers here in Hawaii. Thank you for the opportunity to Council Plan. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the people that we have lined up for testimony. We have a whole bunch of people, probably about 10 of them in opposition and um, one in support, Eric Tanoi is not on, right? No, okay. Members, are there any questions? Nope, seeing none, we're gonna move on. Next up is HB 1717, um, relating to agriculture. First up, we have David Arakawa, Land Use, uh, LERF, Land Use Research Foundation. Next, we have Brian Miramoto, Farm Bureau, in support. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, Brian Miamon on behalf of the Holy Farm Bureau. We'll stand on a written testimony in support. I think the committee has seen this measure in previous years. Um, and again, it's just an attempt to help our, our small farmers, um, you know, finding technology and uh, size appropriate equipment for our farmers here in Hawaii. Thanks for this opportunity to testify. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Next up, we have. I'm just gonna go by the list. 
uh, Nicholas Comerford, Dean of CTAR, in support. Good morning, Dean, Chair. Yep. Good morning, Chair. Uh, Nick Comerford, Dean of, of CTAR. Uh, we'll stand on our written testimony in support and providing comments on what uh, a budget would need to include to make this work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Phyllis of Department of Agriculture and uh, in support. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, we stand on our written testimony in support and uh, defer to University of Hawaii uh, CTAR. Okay. We have several other members in support regarding this legislation. Um, that's all the people we have scheduled for testimony. Members, are there any questions? Seeing no questions, we're going to move on to HB 1711. Relating to the University of Hawaii, first up, we have okay, Brian Miyamoto, Farm Bureau. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Brian Miyamoto on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. We'll stand on our written testimony and support. Just want to emphasize the critical importance of our research and extension stations, and this one in particular for Kauai. Uh, they are lacking staff, uh, and um, the livestock extension position is something that we've heard uh, often uh, that they want to try to fill. Uh, so again, thank you for hearing this measure. Uh, we will stand on our written testimony and support. Okay, next up, we have Phyllis Shimabukura, Department of Agriculture and Support. Thank you, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony uh, in support and deferring to UHCTAR. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Dean of CTAR, University of Hawaii, um, in Thanks support. Again. Thanks again, Chair. Yeah, we stand on our testimony in support, and uh, we'd like to make this consistent with the strategic planning that the college is now undergoing. Thank you. Okay, that's all the people we have to testify. We have countless individuals in written testimony in support. Um, other than that, there's nobody else to testify. Members, are there any questions that you would like to ask? Seeing none, we're gonna move on. Next up, we have HB 844 relating to the University of Hawaii. First up, we have, holy shit. First up, we have University of Hawaii, Dean Comerford in support. Good morning again, Chair. Thanks for the opportunity to, um, to testify. We're in support of this measure. It has been on the dockets for several years and it is acting uh, in response to uh, a long-term committee that did a tremendous amount of really good quality work and uh, based on recommendations that that committee provided to the legislature. So we stand in support. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Brian Miyamoto from the Farm Bureau in support. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. We'll stand on a written testimony in support. Um, can't emphasize how important ag education is uh, for the future of our agriculture sector. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next we have Lloyd Bernal of Hawaii Farm to School, Hui, Hawaii Public Health Lady. Institute. Lady. Lady? Yes. Aloha mai kako, this is Lady Bernal. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm with the Hawaii Farm to School, Hui Statewide Network and Program of Hawaii Public Health Institute. This uh, bill provides for the key recommendation of the P20 preschool to post-secondary agriculture education working group uh, to the 2019 legislature. And the coordinator position at UHC TAR would lead the implementation plan that's also outlined in that 2019 report to the legislature. And so we strongly support this bill, mahalo nui. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, Lady, for mispronouncing your name. Okay, going next, moving on. Hawaii Farmers Union United in support. Hunter, are you there? He's not on, okay. That's all the people that we have scheduled to testify. Any other testifiers listed? Nope, see, no other testifiers listed for this. Um, 
for this bill. We have numerous people, probably three dozen people testified in support. Members, are there any questions? Seeing none, we're moving on. Next up, we have HB 1517 relating to coffee. First up, we have Department of Agriculture with comments. Thank you, Chair. Um, members of the committee, uh, the department stands on its written testimony. Uh, we support the intent of this bill. Um, on uh, we're making comments on um, blends and labeling, and we support a general fund appropriation for the pesticide subsidy program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have um, Hawaii Council District Eight. Hey, Hele, Heleka, Inaba, in support. Hello, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Um, Heleka Inaba, Council District 8 here in Hawaii County, testifying on behalf of myself and my constituents here in North Kona, um, wanting to voice our support and mahalo to Representative Lowen for introduce, introducing this measure. Um, a few months back, the Hawaii County Council passed Resolution 223-21, uh, which pretty much lines up exactly with the intent of Representative Lowen's bill. Um, and everyone who testified was in support, except for those who are benefiting from the current laws, the labeling laws. So we ask for your support in moving this forward, and mahalo for this opportunity to testify. Aloha. Okay, thank you very much. Next testifier, we have Victor Lim in opposition. Hi, Kunghe uh, Fachoy, uh, Chair Hassam, and members of the Committee on Agriculture. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Aloha. The Hawaii Restaurant Association uh, stand in opposition to HB 1517. Uh, that, that's purely because, you know, many of our members and our suppliers have been using the 10% Kona blend for years and years and years, some as long as 40 to 50 years. And that's what our customer wants. That's what we've been doing. And uh, no doubt Kona is a, a premium bean uh, that costs uh, substantially higher than the generic uh, bean that we might get, as well as the fact that the taste profile is also much uh, strong and robust. Uh, so, you know, by forcing the businesses to go away from 10% uh, blend to 20, 30, 40, 50%, uh, you are really uh, are gonna exponentially increase the cost for the businesses and gonna force us to really move away from being able to support the local processors as well as the local distributors uh, that support us all these years. So. So we really feel that uh, uh, for this committee to hold this uh, bill. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have Hawaii Coffee, Gerald from Hawaii Coffee Company in our opposition. Um, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak today and, and for your time. Uh, Hawaii Coffee Company stands in opposition to this bill as well as the Restaurant Association. Um, re regarding this specific bill, um, Hawaii Coffee Company, for context, uh, provides um, blends to consumers anywhere from 10% to 100% Kona beans. Um, we have for many years, uh, I believe we're the largest seller of 100% Kona coffee and the largest seller of 10% Kona coffee and everything in between. And that's really driven by consumer choice, uh, both the consumers at the grocery store and then um, our, our restaurant consumers and their business as they struggle to recover from COVID. I would just like to make four brief points for the committee to uh, consider as you process this bill. Um, number one, I think we all know how hard our farmers have been hit by coffee leaf rust, the ongoing issue with uh, the CBB beetle, unseasonable rain in, in Kona this year. Uh, the one thing that has really kept their businesses afloat is record high coffee prices and our purchases of those products, which um, include the 10% blends has really provided a stability for the industry. We were the first one to go out with, I think 240 for cherry this year, which is a record price on the side of the road. 
and really helped keep prices very high and push prices up as we continue to buy product, both for our mill. And we also purchase a very significant amount of coffee around Big Island from Kau, from other mills in Kona. And we reach out to buy coffee from other islands as well. So our ability to buy coffee is going to go, to, go down and that's gonna bring the price down um, in any sort of economic analysis. Uh, two is this bill is gonna force food production away from Hawaii and more to the mainland and international destinations. And I know it is members of the Hawaii agriculture industry. That's something we don't want. We actually wanna reverse that. And by these products being outsourced to third parties on the mainland, we're gonna lose jobs and we're also gonna lose food security of uh, being able to produce as much food as we want ourselves. And I think we saw during times of COVID um, the importance of us having local production. Um, third, consumer choice. Um, as consumers go to the, the grocery store and the blends, if, if they change um, and consumers want to continue to buy them, not only is it going to ch change from a taste standpoint, but also price is going to go up. Um, consumers are already getting hit by record inflation on food. Um, the grocery store bills are getting much higher. I know we all see it ourselves as well as read about it in the industry. And going to this change is going to increase the commodity price of coffee uh, that people actually buy at the store and it's gonna increase their grocery bill at a time when people are financially struggling. Um, and fourth, and, and this might be most important, is um, I'm struggling to understand the enforcement mechanism for this bill because as coffee goes from 10% to 20% to 30%, uh, 40%, the way this bill is constructed, um, I don't know that the technology exists um, or you know, what, what the, the plan is for the Department of Agriculture to enforce this. Um, the industry is on record across the board as saying there's tremendous fraud uh, within the industry in labeling. I agree with that and fully support the, the fraud uh, bill that was proposed uh, earlier in another committee. Um, but th there's really no mechanism, as I can see it, for anyone to be able to tell within the Agriculture Committee what percent Kona is in a blend, um, first of all, and then to be able to quantify that and enforce that and, and ensure that people are complying with that bill. Um, is a real problem and I, I, something I'd really like the committee and the people constructing the bill to really go back and do work on uh, before we launch it into the marketplace. Um, I appreciate you giving me so much time and consideration and, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Lauren Zerbel of Hawaii Food Industry Association in opposition. Uh, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Alexis Chapman for HFIA. We stand on our testimony in opposition, and I'm available for questions. Okay, next up, we have Chris Manfredi, Hawaii Coffee Association, in support. Chris, you there? Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Chris Manfredi. I'm the Executive Director of the Hawaii Coffee Association. There's a statewide trade organization comprised of other organizations, primarily Maui Coffee Association, Hawaii Coffee Growers Association, KCFA, and stakeholders positioned throughout the supply chain. Uh, we're in support of this measure. Um, speaking to cost, labor is up, fertilizer is up, pest control is up, fuel is up, transportation is up. And our growers are getting squeezed between a high cost of production and downward price pressure, which is a function of these uh, low percentage blends. We've heard previous testifiers attest here and in other committees that the taste is different. And the taste is different because the product that's in the bag is not Hawaiian. These folks are not selling Hawaiian coffee. They're using the 10% as a dodge to be able to put Hawaiian origins on their packaging. We find that offensive. We think the time is now to allow growers to price their coffees uh, at a price point that keeps them in business, particularly with the increased costs that we're all experiencing. Um, we asked for one amendment in the bill as it relates to processing. We'd like the bill to focus on grown in Hawaii, not grown and processed in Hawaii. Some processes are not available in Hawaii like uh, decaffeination. So we asked for that one amendment. And in the second part of the bill, as it relates to the uh, pest uh, control subsidy, uh, we fully support that and the adequate funding of that measure. Uh, we're available for questions. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today. 
We appreciate the committee taking up this important issue for Hawaii's coffee industry. Aloha. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have Bruce Corker, uh, Rancho Aloha in support. Chair Hashem, members of the committee, I am Bruce Corker. I'm a coffee farmer in Kona and I'm a board member of the Kona Coffee Farmers Association. I strongly support HB 1517 and I'd like to make two points uh, in support of the bill. Uh, point one is that for more than 30 years, Hawaii has been the only region anywhere in the world to authorize the use of its regional names, names such as Kona, Ka'u, Maui, and the name Hawaii itself with only 10% genuine content in an agricultural product. France prohibits the use of the name Champagne unless 100% of the wine in the bottle is from grapes grown in the Champagne region. Idaho prohibits the use of the name Idaho potatoes if it's not 100% Idaho potatoes in the bag. Uh, the same with Vermont maple syrup. You cannot use the name Vermont on a package of maple syrup unless 100% is from Vermont. Uh, the same is true of California, California wines. It has to be 100% from California grapes in order to use the word California. Uh, I believe the state of Hawaii needs to provide that same type of protection uh, for its farmers that these other regions provide throughout the world. Point two is that I want to urge members of the committee to read the Hawaii County Council resolution that was referred to by council member Anaba. It is resolution 22321. Uh, the resolution was unanimously adopted on November 3rd by the county council and urges the legislature to enact a 51% minimum. And I would like to read one of the paragraphs from that uh, resolution. It states, and I quote, past efforts made to protect the Hawaii grown brand through the adoption of provisions for truthful labeling of Hawaii grown coffee have failed due to the fierce opposition of the quote, coffee blender close quote entities motivated by their desire to advance their own economic benefit at the expense of Hawaii's coffee industry and its local coffee farmers. I urge the committee to join the Hawaii County Council in supporting Hawaii's farmers. Uh, please pass this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have Hunter Hevelin. Hawaii Farmers Union United in support. Next, we have Mark Schultze, Lava Rock Farms in support. Next, we have Vincent Mina in support. Okay, so that's all the members that we all the people that we have listed to testify. We have several dozen people in support and a handful of people in opposition. Um, see nobody else here to testify. Members, are there any questions? I have a question. Okay. Representative Tokioka, go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been in the State House now for 16 years. And this bill has come almost every single year. And every year I listen to more testimony and better testimony. And um, I don't think anybody who has followed this bill wants our coffee from Hawaii. And you know, I, I, I didn't hear the name Kauai Coffee come up, but I think Kauai Coffee is a big player in the industry. Um, 
uh, I didn't hear anyone who doesn't want Hawaii coffee to be recognized as we move forward. So the questions that I have are a couple. And in um, the Department of Ag's testimony, they're not, they don't have the ability to test um, what is 51%. Um, Mr. Bastanasi uh, from Hawaii Coffee, uh, you said that you, you sell 10% and 100%. How do you distinguish between what is 10% and what is 51%? And it's easy to figure out what 100% is. And then the second question to, to that, to Phyllis and anyone else who, who may want to answer it, is how do we um, check who's, who's, who's doing the checking on what is 51%? So we, I want to start with Mr. Batasi Anse. Sorry if I mispronounced the name. Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Um, thank you, um, Representative, for the question. Um, and um, I, I appreciate it. Uh, to answer your question regarding how we're able to delineate, um, we're a, a larger producer of, of food products, and as such, we go through third-party independent audits, and we have systems, structured systems and processes in place in, in our roasting facility. In the way we segregate products, uh, we roast specific blends um, on specific programs, timings, and through food safety, FISMA, and, and compliance tracking which is a requirement of our organization as well as other large organizations, we're able to trace um, our products straight through the system and, and track them as to when they were blended, you know, what roaster they were on, what day, and, and they went out. Um, th that's allowed because one, we have the, the structure and systems in place that a lot of smaller organizations wouldn't. And two, I know there's been sort of opposition with us and, the, and, and others in the industry, but I, I don't think anyone's ever uh, insinuated that we haven't 100% followed the rules and the law um, all of the time. So we're very diligent in what we do and we haven't you know, had any activities of, of sort of malfeasance. Um, so that's how we do it. The challenge you know, that I raised was if somebody didn't wanna follow the rules, that there's really not a mechanism as I understand it to catch them. And then there are a lot of smaller operations that would be doing smaller volumes that probably don't have the system structures, quality processes in order to ensure that they're putting uh, the right percentages into their blends, or they might not have the right sort of roasters and blenders to, to segregate that. And, and I do hope I, I answered your question, sir. Um, well, you answered the first part. Let me, uh, so Phyllis, are you, are you on Phyllis? Yes, representative. Um, okay, so who goes and checks 51%, uh, 10%, who, who does that? If, if we're the Department of Agriculture and we're the state and we're the one passing laws, who checks them? When there's a complaint, then it's referred to our quality assurance division. And within our division, um, you know, we have um, uh, personnel that um, goes and checks on the roasting, but we also have personnel that checks on labeling. Um, what I wanted to share before I call up uh, our uh, acting division administrator, Dr. Uh, Leo Obaldo, is that, you know, in 2020, um, before COVID um, emerged, uh, we were in discussions with the University of Hawaii to see if there's a way that um, they can assist us with um, researching the proper technology um, that can, can at least, we can at least start with Kona coffee. Um, and um, apparently, um, you know, we started that and, um, you know, things happened in 2020. So uh, we, we never got, um, you know, much progress with that. So we are revisiting that connection, that communication with the University of Hawaii. And to answer your question, if um, you can allow uh, Dr. Leo Obaldo uh, to answer uh, and enter the room. Okay, that would have been the short answer. Okay, let, let's, where's the doctor? Can you put him on? Because I don't want to be the one that makes this hearing last forever, but this is something that comes up almost every single year. And um, I'm going to I'm going to ask, with your permission, Chair, I'm going to ask Mr. Manfredi a question, and maybe even Mr. Corker. But um, Phyllis, if you can get the um, the person that you're referring to, the doctor, on to answer who 
from the state inspects the, the percentage of the coffee. That, that's all I want to know. Okay. Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Representative Toki um, I'm Leo Baldo, uh, Acting Administrator, Quality Assurance Division. Uh, so under the division, we have a measurement standards branch and we have inspectors. Uh, before the RIF, we used to have inspector that goes out to the uh, roasting company and observe the uh, roasting process and make sure that the uh, amount of coffee being roasted is basically 10% or at least 10%. Uh, and uh, after the RIF, uh, you know, we're not able to uh, do that anymore uh, unless there's complaints. And we do look at the records of two years as uh, a reference, whether they're basically complying with the 10% uh, requirement. Okay, thank you very much for that precise answer, uh, Dr. Leo. Okay, so normally if I ask a question, I think I know the answer and that was uh, something that happened on nothing to do with the department, everybody had reduction in force. And so if that's what's needed to do this, then I think that's something that needs to be attached to the bill as well. So uh, thank you, doctor. I'm gonna ask um, Mr. Manfredi uh, a question. Chair, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Chris. Yes, sir. Um, you've been involved in this a long time, lot, much longer than me. Um, how, what is the credibility of the percentage of coffee from the coffee growers? I know you represent a bunch of coffee growers, but in your opinion, what is as an industry standard, uh, the credibility of the labeling with the percentage? 10%, 50%. And I've, I've been struggling with this question for a long time. I mean, how do we know that brand X coffee is 50%, is 100%? I think maybe on Kauai, it's a little bit easier because it's just Kauai coffee on Kauai. And I'm not trying to pump Fred up, although I love the guy. The committee was there this summer. Um, but Kauai is a little bit easier than Kona, right? Yes, that's true. And to answer your question, it really runs the gamut. You know, we see 100% products and we can cup them and we can inspect them physically and get a pretty good idea of whether that's a genuine Hawaiian product or not. Um, and then we can open other packages that either are a blend or purported to be 100%. Um, and it's very clear that they're not either by physical inspection and or cup quality. Um, there is technology now that allows for radioisotope mapping to be able to identify a specific origin of coffees. Um, there's a current uh, lawsuit in Kona the, called the Kona class action case which has brought suit against a number of resellers for counterfeiting coffee. And that same technology that's been applied and accepted in that case uh, can also be applied to blends. Okay. My point to that, um, the question is, if we pass something and we can't enforce it, I mean, what's the use in passing something? Um, and, I, and, and I agree 100% with both sides. You know, I can see Mr. Lim's point. I can see everybody else's point um, who supports this bill. But if we can't enforce it, then how are we going to do this? And um, I will leave it at that. Sorry, Mr. Corker, I don't want to take too much time, but your testimony was really well. Maybe another committee member might want to ask you a question. But thank you, Chair, for the time to um, kind of clarify some of this issue that's been here for at least the 16 years that I've been here. Thank you. Can I uh, add something to? Uh... Uh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, Go so... ahead. Wait, Sorry. hold on, hold on. Wait, I'm going to move on to the next person. Um, I believe Representative Lowen has a question. Sure, thank you. Um, I have a few questions. I think I'll start um, with a quick yes or no question for Gerard. I'm not even gonna try to say your last name, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if we pass a law requiring, uh, you know, 51% Kona coffee, are you going to comply with it? We comply with every law all the time, 100%. Okay. so. Yes. Um, and then thank you for Department of Agriculture. 
uh, I guess uh, my point is that that we have a lot of laws that we can't um, that that most people comply with, right? We don't um, stop and check every single time on something, but if we pass a law, we assume most good citizens will comply. So the passage we would anticipate of any law that increases the percent of Kona coffee that's required will result in most blenders complying. And when there is, um, uh, so you would do like complaint-based enforcement essentially, and that's how it's functioned in the past as I, past as I understand, is that yes. correct? Yes. And do you agree that the, there would still be an impact to passing a law would still uh, effectively, if most people were complying and, and a Hawaii coffee company being the largest blender in the state has just said they will comply. So presumably that, that passage of the law would still have a pretty big effect. It would be on the honor system and the integrity, integrity of the industry. Yes. And then uh, also, uh, if you can confirm, like recently in the, in the past, and they mentioned the class action suit in Kona, that there is kind of an internal watchdog process because if somebody is consistently blending and selling something as 100% Kona coffee, that's not 100% Kona coffee, the farmers are very aware of what the general volume you would expect to see on the market is. And so if there's some excessive amount of 100% uh, Kona coffee being sold that farmers have a pretty good sense it was never grown, then they, you know, they have suspicions about certain companies and could report that to Department of Health. And that has happened in the past, correct? Um, we have gotten complaints from the, the from the industry, from the Gores about uh, uh, fraudulent um, practices. And, and uh, so, like, I guess I'll turn to Chris Manfredi then on this as well. And, and Bruce, if you want to chime in on this enforcement issue. Um, you know, it is challenging for Department of Health to have the, you know, isotope testing technology potentially, but I think that the current case that's going on um, has sort of put people on notice. Um, and that, uh, like, I guess, what, are, what, what is your take on this question of enforcement? Is it worth passing a law that, that can't be enforced to the letter in every in individual instance? Yeah, the short answer is yes, the law has a deterrent effect. And frankly, this wouldn't be an issue if some of the coffees that we're finding in these blends were not such uh, substandard quality. You know, we object to using Hawaii's origin names on packages that have substandard quality coffees in them, um, you know, defective coffees. Um, if, those, if those blends were of high quality, this would be less of an issue for us in terms of protecting our origin names. And then there was also a comment made that the market for a 10% blend has provided stability to the industry um, in this challenging time. Uh, is, I mean, from what I looked at in testimony, every single piece of testimony from a farmer was in support of this. Um, the only people in opposition are not farmers. Uh, so do you feel that uh, the stability, there's st some additional additive stability provided to the industry by having a 10% blend or would actually having 100% uh, be even more beneficial to farmers? Well, the 51% 51% is on the table. Yeah, the 51% is a compromise. Um, the stability is exhibited in downward price pressure. Um, you know, we're having to compete on store shelves with either counterfeit coffees or in this case, blended coffees. The costs for growers are going up, especially now with coffee leaf rust and all supply chain disruptions and having to compete on store shelves with a bag that has one bean in 10 reportedly of Hawaiian origin creates downward pressure for our growers. Yeah, it seems self-evident, one would think. So thank you. Um, for uh, Hawaii Restaurant Association, Victor Lim. Uh, okay, maybe he is not still on the call. Um, is Hawaii Food Industry Association present still? Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, um, so just to clarify, I guess, your, uh, your membership, uh, and I know that includes uh, KTA, which is a Hawaii Island chain, so I'm, uh, 
think that's of interest to probably a lot of people on Hawaii Island, um, if this is their position. But, um, and this you know, question would be probably more directly for Victor Lim and the Restaurant Association if he was here, but since he's not, um, essentially the practice is to take a product that is 90% not Kona or uh, other origin name and stick that name on it with some uh, labeling that does clarify what percent is this and what percent is that, but yet still deceptive labeling um, and sell it for more than it could be sold for. I mean, that adding that origin name adds value to the product, clearly. Um, I wouldn't characterize that as the practice at all, no. Um, I don't think that there is deceptive labeling going on. I think that the labeling, as I think is in our testimony, the current labeling laws clearly indicate what percentage is in what coffee? So you don't agree that it adds value <coughs> to the it product? Adds, yeah, absolutely. Because it's a percentage of Kona coffee and that percentage has value. Okay. So, so you take a product that is, as uh, Chris said, one bean in 10 is actually of Hawaii origin. The other nine are probably from South America. Um, and put something on it that says Kona in the biggest letters on the front of it, <clears throat> that gets sold and yeah. to the detriment of farmers, but the benefit of the organizations you represent. I, again, I don't think that that's a fair characterization because the farmers that are selling the Kona coffee that comprises that 10%, are able or have this whole market of people that can't afford a hundred percent, but so can afford a 10% blend or a 50% blend. There's some um, uh, public service uh, obligation of the state legislature, the people of Hawaii or to provide, you know, um, uh, uh, clean drinking water, good public schools, um, healthcare, uh, food, Right, but but do they need to have a boutique product? Like, should we be democratizing, um, you know, the the price of coffee, the price of of champagne, the price of of boutique items? I mean, this is not. Um, there's no obligation of the state legislature to try to make Kona coffee affordable for everyone. It, we're trying to support our local farmers, and this is a boutique product that we are. I'm creating the value of by blending it with uh, 10% something that isn't as high quality. I'm so not sure what your question think, is. Apologies. Do you think that this, the state legislature has an obligation to uh, provide affordable Kona coffee to like citizens of the world? Or do you think we have a larger obligation to support our farmers? I think that, um, my obligation is to our members question. and to accurately convey our position. Your I will members. leave the difficult question of what exactly the legislature's obligation is up to yourself and the committee members. But I will say that our members want to serve their customers. And these are products that our customers want at different price points with different blends, different roasts. I have some 100% Kona coffee in my house right now. I also have a few different other kinds of coffees, one of which is a blend. One of which is called, I think, Nantucket Blend. I don't think any of it came from Nantucket. Um, I'm personally from Vermont. I drink Green Mountain coffee sometimes. I'm not under the impression that it was grown in the Green Mountains of Vermont. Yeah, but to co um, Vermont coffee. But these or, are the products that I buy. Excuse me. Vermont coffee or Nantucket coffee aren't um, like world-renowned products that are top of their class for quality. That's just like a, you know, I mean, that that's like for any industry across the board. You could have a product, we have all kinds of things we label, Hawaii and Aloha, this and that, that aren't necessarily from Hawaii. And some of those actually are probably also problematic, but there's not um, uh, a top, like when you have a product that is top in the world, you protect the quality of it, you protect the farmers that grow it, you protect the industry by protecting the origin labeling name. And this is what we see across the board as was um, mentioned in testimony earlier. So thank you. Um, I have further questions. Who else is on here? Well, it's unfortunate Victor Lim isn't here because I did want to um, ask him further questions. But yeah, I would just make the point: this is, you know, the this is about supporting the farmers, not providing a affordable uh, 
coffee that makes people think they're drinking something from Hawaii when it's not. Thank you very much. You are, are you, we're moving on. Um, Representative Perusa or Vice Chair Perusa, do you have a question? I do. I just have a quick question for um, Director Shimabukuro Geyser. Those, if you're still on. Yes, Vice Chair. Uh -huh. So I wanted to follow up um, with Chair Lowen's questioning and, and to ask you if the reservations that you expressed in your testimony, just to um, help the public understand that those reservations had um, more to do with lack of capacity, lack of resources um, dedicated to this effort than um, anything else. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we just want to be fully transparent that, you know, that um, if the expectation is that we have the ability to enforce, um, currently we don't have the resources to do that. Uh, we respond, as Dr. Albaldo said, uh, by complaints. So it's complaint driven. Okay, and then you had also mentioned that um, the technology is in process of development um, and that CTAR has been working on that in the past or, or as recently as 2020. We is were, um, we, we have been in communication with the university, uh, with a, a, a researcher there. Uh, I'm not certain he's with CTAR um, and uh, we're trying to um, reconnect with him to see if um, we can get more information of what's required for the state or for the department, um, you know, to use the technology to uh, help with the enforcement. Okay, and and um, over the course of my um, experience with you working on this committee, it's always been my sense that you feel that your obligation, your responsibility, is to support the farmers. Is that correct? Uh, yes, there are. Um, you know, important part, um, the tar uh, focus of our mission. Okay, so that if um, we could provide the resources for enforcement or that additional capacity, then that would help you fulfill your responsibility. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Are anybody else has questions? Seeing none, we are moving on. Next up, we have HB 1155 relating to coffee. First up, we have Department of Agriculture with comments. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the committee. Uh, we stand on our written testimony. Okay, Available next, for questions. Next, we have Department of Taxation, Representative Emer Emeritus Choi. Is he on? Not on. Okay. Next up, we have um, City Council, Council District Number Eight, Inaba. Council Member Inaba. Aloha. Good morning. Go ahead. You got the floor. I'm so sorry. I missed the question. I was on a phone call. Could you repeat the question? HB one one five five in opposition. Oh, I'll just stand on my written testimony on that item. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Lauren Zook Servo, Hawaii Food Industry Association in opposition. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony in opposition. Thank you. Okay, next we have Hawaii Coffee Company in opposition. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, we stand in opposition to this bill uh, for two reasons, uh, one of which uh, we just discussed at some length in the, in the prior um, bill, which is enforcement um, and the inability to enforce the percentages um, against this. Sec secondarily, um, we, are, we are concerned about potential conflicts with federal trademarks and how this legislation would, would, would um, clarify um, as us and other companies have federal trademark renewals for products we've been selling for many years, both in Hawaii, on the mainland, and internationally, how uh, potential conflicts with this law in Hawaii would impact our trademarks and our ability to sell our products, both as the Hawaii Coffee Company, Royal Kona Coffee, all of our brands, and other brands of other companies operating here could potentially be impacted. And I think it creates a bit of um, potential conflict between the federal 
uh, trade commission on trademarks between other states labeling laws and, and regulations and the ability of us uh, to sell to sell our products within our established trademarks we've spent you know 150 years building um, so that that's um, a point to please consider um, in reviewing the bill thank you for your time okay thank you very much next we have bruce corker in opposition thank you uh chair hasham members of the committee um, again, I'm a Kona coffee farmer. I strongly oppose HB 1155 for the same reasons that I strongly support uh, 1517. A 15% minimum would not significantly change the situation with regard to consumer fraud or economic damage to farmers caused by the current 10% blend law. Um, additionally, I would point out that this bill would impose a surtax on uh, uh, Kona coffee sales and would adversely affect uh, farmers' income. And the purpose of that surtax is to fund the state's efforts to obtain a federal uh, recognition for 15% blend. So. We, the farmers, would be funding the operation to develop a trademark which damages uh, the reputation of our coffee. We request that you defer the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is all the, do we have anybody else? Oh, we have Chris Manfetti, White Coffee Association in opposition. Aloha Chair, members of the committee, Chris Manfredi, Executive Director of Hawaii Coffee Association. We stand in opposition to this bill. Uh, we don't understand a need to protect uh, via trade mark or trade name or anything else for Kona Coffee Blend. Uh, this bill is specific to Kona, yet there are a number of other origins throughout the state that are recognized by the state. Uh, additionally, we oppose the surcharge of the bill. We ask that the bill be held. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is all the people we have registered to testify. Um, is there anybody else? Seeing none. Members, are there any questions? Seeing none, we are moving on. Next up, we have HB 1864, relating to school food programs. First, we have Department of Agriculture in support. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Yes, the department stands on its written testimony in support and we defer to Department of Education. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Department of Education in support. Randy Tanaka, are you there? Um, Aloha, Chair Hashem, Vice Chair Peruso. Uh, Randy Tanaka, Department of Education. We stand by our written testimony. Uh, and stand by to answer any questions should you have. Aloha. Okay, thank you very much. Nice lay, by the way. Thank you. It's <laughs> my last stuff, day. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Oh, your last day. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> You're celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up we have Ulupono, Micah, in support. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Micah Munikata here on behalf of the Ulupono Initiative. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony and support. Uh, just want to highlight one quick item here. I know that this bill is looking to sort of adjust or provide some funding for cafeteria purposes and, and helping our, around training and equipment. But um, we do note that um, from our perspective, one of the most important aspects, um, which is within House Bill 2304, is, is the centralized data system that's referenced um, by the DOE as a huge need. Um, we do think that establishing that data system would help to make strategic decisions on how to move forward with a plan to, to reaching the 2030 goal and, and really the 2050 goal. Um, so um, we asked the committee to consider adding some additional funding for that system but we are supportive of the the cafeteria side and trainings thank you okay thank you very much next we have hawaii farm bureau and support brian you there yes thank you chair members of the committee the hawaii farm bureau will stand on its written testimony in support okay 
Okay, that, do we have anybody else? One more person? Oh, next we have Hawaii Farm to School Hui um, in support. Lindy, are you there? Yes, aloha. My co Lady Bernal, Hawaii Farm to School Hui with Hawaii Public Health Institute. We support this bill and note that cafeteria upgrades and staff training are key components of a successful and equitable Hawaii Farm to School program in the DOE. Our testimony references two reports from work that's been done to pilot farm to school meals in Kohala and Mililani, and also to uh, inventory all school cafeterias in the DOE system on the island of Kauai. Um, both of these support the recommendations and the appropriations made in this bill. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lighty. That is, that is all the members, I mean, that is all the people that we have to testify. Um, we have, Jesus, about four dozen people in testifying in support. Nobody in opposition. Um, members, are there any questions? Okay, no, no questions. Representative Peruso, go ahead. I have a quick question for A.S. Tanaka. Um, so noting uh, the comments of Mr. Munakata of, with respect to data collection, um, I'm also aware of multiple bills moving through this session that seek to co further codify um, farm to state um, goals and uh, language. And I'm wondering if you're aware of any bills, because I have not seen any, that would do what Mr. Monacata is asking for, which is that data collection piece that would help us with the reporting necessary to make sure the departments are complying with the law. So is your department, um, have you introduced any measures um, uh, to support your data collection efforts? Hello, Rep. Russo. No, we have not. I have not taken a look at uh, Rep. Munikata's uh, proposals. I uh, look at it from the context of what we need to collect in the DOE to match the, the product against our, our market demands, i.e. our student and our, our production. So I have not looked at his, his views. We primarily focus on the data that we need to capture in the DOE to be effective with the uh, mandates to get increased uh, local consumption, product consumption. Okay, uh, just to clarify, what he's referencing is just um, the findings from multiple reports about um, an area of weakness in the Department of Education with respect to data collection. And I will note that um, if we look at the Department of Public Safety, for example, um, they have managed to create a data collection system that is uh, very effective in terms of disaggregating the kinds of local products that are being used in their institution. So um, that the data collection system that they're using is something that um, the Department of Education might want to look at adopting. So what, what I hear you saying is that you are not looking at uh, moving towards more effective data collection. No, no, that's not what, what I'm saying. We have oh, okay. a, a we have a system now in place that is relatively old, given the new technologies that are available. We have looked at another system where a highly decentralized purchasing system. So, what uh, in in public safety, you know, they may I think they have about twelve units that purchase. Um, so the magnitude of our two hundred fifty seven against the the collection that they need is, is substantially different, but we are looking at a system that not only collects our purchasing, but our inventory management and our supply line. So we, we are looking, in fact, we've had two discussions with a provider, um, but we're still not there on final decision. Uh, It'll come okay. soon though. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit confused now because you say you are having discussions with the provider, mm -hmm. um, but you are not coming to the legislature for funding for that that system. Yes, Is we're that, not. We're do not. Do you mean to say that you we don't need to worry about funding your data collection system? 
I would I wouldn't say that. We're not ready to tell you this is this is the options that we have. The the system we have now has its limitations because of its age from a technology yeah. standpoint to upgrade. Um, so that's we we hope we can live with what we have, but my team is telling us defining for me the limitations of that system. And and training's a big part of it, training our staff at the school level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, members, any more questions? Seeing none, next, we're moving on. Lastly, we have 17, HB 1705, relating to agriculture park leases. Give me a minute to catch up here. Where's Tosh? Oh, and where's the Department of Agriculture? I know they're Okay, first up, we have Department of Agriculture in opposition. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the department stands on its written testimony, uh, respectfully opposing the measure and available to answer questions. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, next up we have Farm Bureau Brian Miyamoto in uh, in support. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Brian Miyamoto here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Uh, we'll stand on written testimony supporting this measure. Uh, we believe this is a support mechanism. Uh, for small parcels on Ag Park, 25 acres or less. Again, we're concerned with the uh, uh, succession of many of our farms and also the ability to, for the small farmers to invest in, in their infrastructure as their leases come up. Uh, so we do ask for your support for this measure. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Okay, next up we have Morris Atta, Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair, Shem, members of the committee. The department will stand on its testimony in, um, uh, expressing its uh, strong concerns and, and opposing the measure um, and uh, will be available for questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the people that we have scheduled to testify. Uh, is there anybody else? Nope. Nobody else. Does anybody have questions? Seeing my question. Uh, I, I have a quick one, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Representative. I'll, I'll be very quick though, because I, I got to drive into the Capitol, so I'll be very fast. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a question from Mo Moata, actually. Um, uh, first, I just want to express my appreciation um, that over the course of the interim, you were able to provide me with uh, a lot of context and information on this. Um, but beyond that, uh, I saw in the testimony you referenced that there was a current wait list for some of these ag park leases. I was wondering if you could give context as to um, potentially how many of those lessees were um, neighbor islands or like big island um, kind of applicants or how many were on Oahu? What's what's the demand like on the neighbor islands, I guess? Of course, yeah. Um, I will ask, I don't have that on me right now, but I will check our, with our staff for the breakdown and we can get it to the committee and, and yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I'd appreciate that. Um, and then uh, the, the only other question I have um, either for you or for Phyllis is, you know, some of the testimony referenced that these Ag Park uh, leases are perfect as incubators. Um, however, the original terms of these leases for the most part are over 50 years. Um, so I feel like in practice, that may not necessarily be the case, at, at which point, you know, um, if we're not actually incubating, then I'm trying to find why it would meet our strategic goals to kind of force these farmers to relocate. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could comment briefly on that. And then that's all I got. Thank you. Sure. You know, um, the, the concept of the in incubating, um, being an incubator for for new farmers is not necessarily one that is, you know, clearly laid out anywhere, but um, 
the 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 notion of creating parcels of public lands available for farmers and typically uh, it, um, at, at sizes that are more suited to new or beginning farmers and smaller operations. Uh, one of the key, I guess, objectives is to get farmers into our system, get as many farmers going. And uh, new and beginning farmers tend uh, uh, to, you know, the five to 10 acre, you know, size uh, that tends to be best suited for that kind of startup. Um, the notion is that, you know, by providing infrastructure support and um, to those kinds of small clusters of, of small farming communities, um, it would really help primarily new and um, uh, beginning farmers to get a start on, um, on farming and establishing themselves and, and trying out their operations and getting better at it and creating successful farming operations without having to actually deal with putting a whole lot of upfront capital to buy land, <clears throat> to build infrastructure, make sure they have water, electricity and all that. And so <clears throat> the way ag parks were created, it, it, it lended itself to that kind of uh, support for the farming industry. And that's, that's <clears throat> primarily where the concept comes from. Okay, uh, I really appreciate uh, your time and expertise and I'll probably um, talk story a little bit offline about maybe, maybe there's some sort of balance that can be struck um, where we're still kind of promoting the strategic vision of the state um, to kind of expand on this agricultural industry while also providing those opportunities for people to enter the market um, now but not at the expense of our current productive ag lands um, but I, I do really appreciate your time thank you thank you very much um, representative martin you have a question I did. Um, this is for the Department of Agriculture. Um, I appreciate your concerns. Um, I I do think that um, the you know the idea that it when somebody gets an ag lease, they have the right to continue it intergenerationally in perpetuity without any competition is something that we do want to change. And I wonder if there is a way to address this need to invest near the end of your lease. Um, while still allowing competition for potential alternative uses that might better meet our state goals for food production, et cetera. So I wonder if there could be a process um, when someone applies for that extension that it has to go out to basically go out to bid. You know, there's a public, um, they, there's an opportunity to compete um, or, you know, the current tenants to keep that extension or see if there are other interested parties that um, might, you know, better meet the state goals for that amazing um, asset that we have. If you could please comment. Thank you. Yeah, um, I understand, <clears throat> I guess, what you're trying to accomplish by opening it up to others. Uh, who may be interested in using the land. Um, I'm not sure I can respond in the sense of whether or not that's something that ought to be done because generally speaking, um, the reasons for granting an extension is to um, support or encourage uh, uh, either capital investment into the property that actually puts value into our, our state land or um, if, we, you know, there's a need to support the current lessee. The notion of opening that option up to the general public, um, I think is a different political question um, from one of, uh, are we trying to help the existing lessee continue and survive? And so I'm not sure how to answer your question about whether or not we can create a process or whether or not it's an appropriate process to create uh, given the purpose of uh, an extension request. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, maybe there is, um, maybe the right answer is to let leases expire at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, Vice Chair, you have a question? I do, I have a couple quick questions um, for uh, Dr. Shimabukuro Geyser. 
Um, and the first is um, the status of these lands. So I know that we're talking about ag park lands and I was wondering if you had a sense or if there's someone on your team here today who has a sense of um, what proportion of those lands are seeded lands? Uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair. Um, uh, we can't tell you uh, a metric at this time, but um, staff um, has, um, has said that a majority of our lands are considered seeded lands and we do com comply with um, what we're required to pay um, for seed, seeded lands. So the majority of the Department of Ag, Ag Park lands are seeded lands? Yes. Okay, and then um, noting, I think in your testimony um, that there are more than 250 people currently on the waiting list for Ag Park lands, um, do you have a plan in place to bring more land into the ag park system? And if so, what is that plan? Well, we hope that um, we will get legislative approval to um, uh, for our C CIP request to get uh, the Kunia Roy Royal Kunia Ag Park um, uh, infrastructure going. You know, uh, that's an opportunity for the department to um, provide 24 five acre lots on uh, one of the best uh, quality uh, uh, land available in our state. And um, we're, we're working on uh, to you know, open and make available another ag park. Okay, and then one final question. Have you had any conversations with ADC about um, converting the five, I, I believe it's around 5,000 acres on Kauai that is tillable, but is not currently and has never been um, used by farmers on ADC land, converting that to ag park land. Uh, we do, um, and I'll um, defer to um, Morris to um, fill in the details or, or um, Brian Cow, our administrator. Um, you know, we have recently transferred over um, lands from DOA to ADC on Kauai um, for Ag Park. Morris, do you want so, to add to that? So then do those, those, those parcels also, they're no longer under your jurisdiction? They're being managed by ADC? Uh, just, uh, recent, just recently. I, I think it's just um, a matter of a few months ago that it's okay. been transferred over. So I was actually talking about in transferring in the other direction. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lands that ADC is not using, thousands of acres of tillable good land, um, but they're coming to you for Ag Park land. Uh, we, we are not aware of any um, ADC lands uh, coming to the department at this time. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions? Seeing none, we are going to recess for decision making.
complicated fix. Okay, first up we have HB 1717. Chair's recommendation is to pass unamended. Uh, no discussion? Good. Um, Vice Chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1717 unamended. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Rip Lauren. Aye. Rip Martin. Aye. Rip Matayoshi. Aye. Rip Todd. Aye. Rip Tokioka. Aye. Rip Matsumoto. Aye. Chair, uh, your measure has been, or your recommendation has been adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have HB 1711. Chair's recommendation is to pass on amendment. Vice Chair for the vote. Uh, Chair's recommendation is to pass unamended um, HB 1711. Chair and Vice Chair voting aye. Uh, are there any, seeing all members in attendance, um, are there any reservations or no's? Seeing none, either on Zoom or in the room, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Okay, next up we have HB 1844. Chair's recommendation is to pass on amendment. Vice Chair for the vote. Chair and Vice Chair vote, both vote aye on HB 1844. Uh, are there any reservations or no votes? Seeing none, either on Zoom or in the room. Chair, your sure. recommendation uh, has been adopted. Oh. Vice Chair, did we, uh, which bill are we voting on right now? We're on HB 1844. Okay, what about, did we vote on 1711? Did I miss that? We did. And I have an I vote for you. Okay, and then so we voted on 1717 as well. Correct. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. No, no problem. I'm I on all the, the first four. Yes, thank you. Okay. Are there any? Uh, so going back to HB 1844, are there any reservations or no votes? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Okay, next up we have HB 1517 relating to coffee. Uh, the chair's recommendation is to adopt amendments from the Hawaii Coffee Association to remove the words and process and to defect the date to 7 1 2050 um, and add an appropriation section to buy equipment for testing. And I want to put in the committee report for the next committee to look at. Um, if there's possible ways for the Department of Agriculture to test or what they need to test or enforce this. Any questions? Uh, I just want to thank, thank the chair for passing this and supporting the farmers and so mahalo. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation on HB 1517 is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Are there any reservations or no votes? Seeing none in the room or on Zoom, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Okay, HB 1155 relating to coffee. Uh, there, since there was no testimony and support, we're gonna defer this. Next up, we have HB 16, 1864. Relating to school farm, school food programs, chair's recommendation is to defect date, and that's basically it. Pass with amendments, defecting it, uh, effective date 7 1 Okay, on HB 1864, chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and vice chair vote aye. Are there any reservations or no votes? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Okay, thank you, members. Next, we have HB 1705. The Chair's recommendation was to blank out the years um, and continue this conversation moving on and put in the committee report to for CPC to see what is what years is appropriate or when would it be appropriate for how long to open it up. So, um, and defect date at 7 one
Any concerns or reservations? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation on HB 1705 is to pass unamended. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Are there any no's or reservations? Um, no vote, please. Are there any other no votes or reservations? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Okay, thank you very much, members. Next up, we have, we're going up, going back to the very first bill, HB 1726, relating to agriculture buildings. The Chair's recommendation is to pass this with the HD1. So we're gonna strip out everything, go back to the original law, and um, we're going, the county, the county plan, not the county plan, I'm sorry, the farm plan, we're gonna change so that way to, how do I say this? On page, on the bill, it says on page seven, line from one to five, it says owner of the owner or occupant that intends to utilize the exemptions under this statute shall provide an ag farm plan to the appropriate county agency of its size, type, and location and uses. And for the definition of egg farm plan, we're going to say um, egg farm plan means a document submitted to the Department of Planning and Permitting or appropriate agency assessing spe site specific aspects of of a property and outlining structures needed to meet the agriculture's operations and goals. So that's about it. We're gonna take out all the environmental stuff, soils, everything, and we're gonna put an enforcement mechanism. We're gonna change um, the statute from where, Jesus, what page is this? So in statute where it says section K number 11, it says applicable department of agency may, and from, from going on from May, it says failure to allow an inspection after the appropriate notice has been provided by mail, mail or posting on the property shall result in the issuance of a notice of violation and notice of order with the appropriation civil fines until corrected. So basically, so if access is denied to the property, the county can go immediately to a civil fine. They don't have to go through that court, the whole court process where it's say the agency has to apply to the district court and circuit court and get an officer to accompany them to go on the property. Um, we're gonna strip that out. So if they, if the county officer is denied access, they can immediately assess fines. Um, that's about it. Oh, and we're gonna keep the definition of barns in there. Okay. Yep, that's it. Any questions? Any confusion? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you very much members. Vice Chair for the vote. Okay, on HB 1726, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Are there any no's or reservations? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Thank you very much for your support, members. We are adjourned.